Uh, welcome to the 9.30 service on this Trinity Sunday. Uh, a welcome to those who are worshipping online uh, and to each of us as we gather in a community that is both in cyberspace and direct space. Uh, the Reverend John Humphreys is the preacher uh, at this service. My name is Dean Drayton and I will be uh, the liturgist. Our first act together is to light the candle, the Christ's candle, representing the one who is with us. Our prayer as we gather in worship. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of your glory. O living God, we remember how Isaiah saw you he was in the temple, but then he became aware of your mighty presence, high and lifted above the temple with just the hem of your robe about them there, the columns shaking at the voices as the temple filled with smoke. Holy Lord, you came to Isaiah in your majesty and glory in the temple. You come also to us in your majesty and glory on a hill outside the temple in Jerusalem, lifted up on a cross in agony and darkness to show us the glory of your suffering love for us. Holy Lord, we cannot see you but you are present with us in your Holy Spirit, plunging us into the full river of God's glory. Holy Lord, you have our attention. In Jesus' name, we now gather. Amen. We need to be reminded where we are we acknowledge that we live in the country of the Bidjigal people of the Darug Nation. We acknowledge the role of the elders as custodians of this land for eons. We acknowledge their leaders in their role in this week, this day of sorry, being sorry for the children taken from their families in the name of law, and we acknowledge the role of the leaders this week in a, a national week of reconciliation. And two, we joined with those elders as they prepare their future leaders to come. It's time for us, if we're able to stand, but for all of us to sing, the heavens shall declare.
our prayer of praise and thanksgiving. Eternal, triune God, we praise you for the glory of your presence. How marvellous is the way you come to us as Father, Son and Holy Spirit in ways that blow our mind with the richness of your glory, the wonder of a redemptive love and a profound presence that keeps on surprising us with the wonder of your creative fruitfulness in our midst, in the creation. It's like you are like the flowers of many kinds, giving a tapestry of colour that dazzles. You come like the colours of green in the trees in the forests and scrub gums. You come in so many ways, so many gorgeous ways. Oh, we praise you for for you have not left us to ourselves, but in the very depths of our lives, we find that you were the giver of our life and you were the one who has acted for us. You have opened possibilities for us that we've only just begun to discover. Thank you, Lord, that you keep breaking the moulds that we make of you. You do not allow us to bind you into our own dogma and convictions. You burst into our midst with new life and call us on to dream again with you. Thank you for a love that brims over with a compassion that brings tears to our eyes. Thank you that you can be trusted. When the world goes awry, when violence breaks out, there's still your spirit of peace and life is there to sustain hope and hold to reality in the chaos of wars, disasters and tragedies. Lord God, we know we make many gods in our minds, but you in your Trinitarian presence keep us focusing upon our Lord Jesus Christ that by your spirit we see him more clearly and hear him more clearly speaking of how you are with us. Lord God, we thank you for the blessing that he is to us in showing us who you are and the blessing for enabling us to come and to praise you and thank you in his name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning online. Um, today is National Sorry Day. Sorry is not about blame. Sometimes people react to that name and say, well, I've done nothing wrong, it's not my fault. And it isn't. Sorry is a word of compassion. If someone loses somebody dear to them, I will say, I am sorry. I'm sorry for your loss. I'm sorry that you are missing that person. And I have done nothing to cause them suffering myself, but I recognize that. And Sorry Day commemorates the reality of forced adoption, of forced adoption, sorry, forced removal, sometimes adoption forced removal of Aboriginal children 
from their families under the policy that we would try and turn black people and make them more the superior white culture of our Anglican, Anglo-Celtic British society. So we remove them from their family, remove them from their language so they wouldn't learn that, remove them so that they wouldn't understand their culture and traditions and indoctrinate them in a new religion and a new way of being that they might live better in the way that white Australians lived at that time. And so I wear this shirt today and I acknowledge those stories that I've heard. And those stories like Auntie Vera and Auntie Nancy at Wilmaringal, who weren't stolen themselves, but their mother couldn't speak language or teach them any customs or traditions lest they be taken away. And so they, as elders now, can't transmit some of their culture because it's lost, because they weren't able to receive it. It is also, as Dean said, Trinity Sunday. Trinity Sunday, if you've read the newsletter, um, is one Sunday which is not based around the life of Jesus or a celebration of things like that. It's based around a doctrine. And so to help us get this idea that God is three in one, I brought in Bob. This is Bob's world. Bob lives in this small little world bound by four walls and immersed in water. He has one tree, one rock, but that's all right. He's plastic, so he doesn't seem to mind too much. Um, what you may not be able to see is that Bob can't even see up. His ceiling, his roof, his sky is actually reflective. And you and I exist outside of Bob's world. We can move in ways Bob can't. And if I'm standing above Bob, even if he looked up, he couldn't see me. I can enter into Bob's world, but I have to enter in. And if I do that, Bob sees these three strange things enter into his reality. Three separate beings or objects, however, they just mysteriously appear from the sky and he sees them as individual and separate, but you know that they're part of me. They're just my fingers. But for Bob, they are three separate things. It's just a way of trying to get our head away around the fact that God is three persons but one God, three persons but not three people, a trinity, triunity, Try three, uno, one, triune, three in one, one in three. Put Bob back over here. Um, oh, I didn't reset it. It's probably not going to work now. We're going to make a mess. There's going to be fire everywhere. I'll try and, no, it's not going to work. Here we go. I knew I forgot something. I shouldn't have had that biscuit and cup of tea. There we go. So last week, I used the fire NATO as an example of the Spirit of God. But it's also a good way to help us understand the Trinity. The flame is like the light of Christ. We lit the light. When my kids went to a kids' church, they lit the candle every week and they said, Jesus is the light of the world. But to light the light comes like the Father from above, 
the light of Christ. And I use the idea of the spirit who you can't see, like the breath of God, that the light of Christ in us gets activated and spun up. I'll slow it down a bit. There we go. It's going too fast. And it changes things. When the spirit of God works with Christ in us, then God is glorified. God the Father is glorified. They're just examples to try and get our heads around something that's actually indescribable with our language. We can describe it. I mean, I just have in two different ways. I can use the example of water, which exists in three states, solid, liquid, gas. There are hyperfluids, and yes, I know there's plasma in other states like that, but for water, we know those. It's still water, but it can exist in three states, just like we have one God who exists in three persons, not three people. And we'll talk a bit more about that later. So an activity to take home today, your take-home activity is try writing a prayer but using the three persons of God in the prayer because we tend to settle into our favourite person of God that we tend to talk to most whether it be Spirit, Jesus, or God, the Father, or Father, whatever word we use, we tend to use the same address to God. But I encourage you to write a prayer considering the three persons of God and just explore that by just trying to write something down. So that's your take home. If you're interested and want to do something, we've got some Trinity colouring in over there as well on the activity table but we're going to continue in prayer. Thank you. Let us pray. Lord God, we know we make it hard for you to find us and bless us. We spend so much time caught up in our own tasks and plans, our own thinking and action. Without even thinking, we turn our back on you. Your invitation to set our minds on your spirit gets lost in the minutiae of our daily routines of work and home and leisure. We are sorry. There are times when we know there is a way to walk so that we honour you and care for others. But we find it so easy to hesitate, to draw back into the normal ways we operate by habit rather than being drawn out into new ways of care for others and ourselves. And then there are the times, the times, Lord, when we beat ourselves up because of what has happened, what we have done, and we let our thoughts condemn us on and on and on and on. And all the while, You wait and invite us to turn to you, to turn to you, to the forgiveness you've given us in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. To turn to you by simply admitting we have let you and ourselves down. And then receive your standing offer to start again. Not just forgiven, but to start in the wholeness and rightness of life with you. Thank you that you do not give up on us. But in your spirit, keep whispering to us your offer of life and wholeness. 
thank you that you have made it all so plain in and through the giving of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of your forgiving and renewing presence, where we now stand. Amen. The words of assurance for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness that we are children of God. Listen for that verse in the reading that will come. For the words of assurance, fellow children of God, Now we're ready to sing again. If please stand if you're able and give thanks. Aaron will bring us the readings from Romans and John. The first reading is from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we are obligated not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If we in fact suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. The second reading is from John chapter 3. Verses 1 to 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with that person. Jesus answered him, 
Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe me, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent into the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In this we hear the word of the God. Thanks, Kieran, for the reading. You can tell he's done some drama work. He reads really well. Um, I don't normally recycle sermons. Um, but two weeks in a row I have. So that one because it's super cool. Uh, and this one because I thought it worked but then realized I'd preached it wrong so I needed to preach it right. So I'm going to try and preach it right today. Um, Nicodemus comes to Jesus and encounters Jesus. Jesus tells him all this stuff. And he goes, how can that be so? I don't get it. And Jesus goes, how can you be a teacher of Israel and not understand these things? And the doctrine of the Trinity is a bit like that. It's one of those things that we probably can't really understand. And the stuff that it talks about really is hard to understand. Um, But I want to, like Nicodemus, tell two other stories of encounter. So the Trinity is a doctrine, this doctrine that God is three in one. And if you want to learn more, read the newsletter this week. Um, And there's some bit more around the Trinity and how that all works. But I want to go to one of my heroes, which is Carl Sagan. Carl, the late Carl Sagan, unfortunately died, um, is a co- was a cosmologist, and he, I credit as being somebody who not only encouraged me and led me into a love of science and the cosmos, because that was his role as a cosmologist, but also as a science c- communicator. And he had, I think, a show, which was Cosmos, And he had this way of telling stories and the whole image, he, his whole show, and which is a series of shows, began with a dandelion seed. And he said, what if we journeyed into the cosmos like a dandelion floating through space? And so he took us on this journey into science. And I have the book, and it's still one of my most treasured books. Um, the Bible is really important, but I've got, a f- I've got a few of those. But this book is, is important because Carl helped me understand my faith. By looking at the work of Carl Sagan, I actually became deeper in faith, which is quite ironic because Carl was actually a, an atheist. Not an aggressive one like, you know, Dawkins, um, but just just didn't get it. He said, your God is too small for my universe. 
his understanding of the universe was so complex and the way Christians spoke about God was too small and too limited that he could not believe he was atheistic. But he told a story in one of his shows based on the book, by a story by Edwin Abbott Abbott. I don't know what his parents were thinking about there. But anyway, I thought one surname is good. But it's an amazing story called Flatland. Um, you can look it up. It's pretty much free now. You can find a free version. Um, and it's highly complex. Um, but Carl used it because it's a romance of many dimensions. He used it to indicate this idea that I sort of did with Bob, that there is point land, which is no dimensions or one dimension, two dimensional world. One dimension is line land, so one dimension. Points have no dimension. Lines have one dimension. He talked about square, which we'll get into a minute, which was in flat land, which is just two dimensions. And then space land. So um, here is his story that as he told it. So we live in three dimensions. But imagine if we could be squashed flat and lived in two dimensions, just like completely flat. Then we'd be in flat land. And we'd all live in our flat world. There are other dimensions, and this is the story from a little bit from Edwin Abbott's story. So, flat creatures are flat. They have no height. They can move around and in and out of their houses, but they can't go up and down. In fact, they can't even conceive of up and down because there is only forward and sideways and around that way. They have length and width, but no height. No height at all. That is a foreign idea to them. And the story that he tells is of a flat creature um, named A Square who had this encounter with the third dimension. So one day in the third dimension, an apple comes along and sees Flatland and desires in an in a gesture of interdimensional inter goodwill to speak to a square who happened to be at the time locked in his own little house. And the apple says to poor little square living in his square world, hello, I'm Apple, I'm from the third dimension. And square goes, what? He hears his voice coming from within and without of him but in his locked house, this voice speaking to him and he thinks maybe he's going insane. How can I hear this voice? And Apple explains he's in the third dimension. You know, at right angles to length and breadth. And Square can't get it. So Apple goes, well, I'll show you and goes into flatland. And you know if you cut an apple, you get sections. So poor Square's living in his flat house and sees an apple magically descend into his locked room, appear out of nowhere, so to speak. And not only that, but this changing person, this being that morphs before his very eyes. And say, you can see me now, see me. And Square goes, well, I just see this strange thing and I'm clearly going insane. Well, Apple gets a little bit frustrated and possibly not in the best of goodwill, descends down into Flatland and picks up a Square and throws him into the third dimension, who is now, I've lost Square. He's gone. Anyway, he's now fluttering in the third dimension. And now he can see not only a cross, he can see into not only the houses of everyone, but inside all of the flat creatures. And he goes, this is amazing. He gets it. I am now, there's a creature that is roundly round and 
descends back eventually after this time, floats back into flatland and appears magically. And all of friends rush up and says, how did you just magically appear out of nowhere? He says, I have been up in the third dimension. And they go, what? There is no such thing. Well, it's at right angles to our existence. And you're not up. Point to it, they say. I can't. I can't point to it. I can't show you it. But believe me, it happened. It was real. I was there. And he gets frustrated. Um, and that's the end of the story. I forget where I put my square. It's covered. <gasps> anyway. A square is gone. Um, what's that got to do with anything? Well, there's Uncle Carl. And he's telling the story with his apple. Oh, there's A square. He's flooded on the ground. So A square and apple. How did that help me? Well, for me, it was this understanding that God is beyond time space. As creator of this universe, which is ever expanding in only three dimensions, or four if you count time, God is outside of that. And when God speaks to us, we hear God's voice in us and from beyond us, but have no words to describe that. Carl goes on to describe a hypercube or a tesseract as a way of getting our heads around this idea of something more than three dimensions. And if you take a line and extend it at right angles to itself, you get a square. If you take a square and go at right angles to that, you get a cube. If you take a cube and put it at right angles to itself into the fourth dimension, you get a tesseract or a hypercube. And you go, Whoa. So what we have is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional representation of a four-dimensional sub um, figure. Uh, and it's supposed to hurt our head. But using mathematics, um, we can actually look at this. So this is a cube. And if we extend it in all directions at right angles to itself, which we can't point to but we can represent graphically, it looks like a cube within a cube. And if we rotate the cube in three dimensions, this is what happens. But watch as they start to rotate it mathematically through the fourth dimension. And you go, what? It's, it's beyond our conceptual. Well, we can sort of conceive it, but we can't experience it. And if we were to take that cube and extend it as what it would look like in three dimensions, it looks like a cross. I thought that was nice. So for me, as the apple is to a square in flatland, God is to us and transcends our understanding. That's where I left it last time, and that's where I made the mistake, because I made the mistake that Uncle Carl made. See, the Trinity is a doctrine but I'm not here to teach you the doctrine. That's not what preaching is about. Hopefully you understand it a bit more, but that's not the point. It doesn't quite make sense, and I can talk about God being in three persons. And I can talk about the fact that many men and women, this is a quote from J.B. Phillips, many men and women today are living often with the inner dissatisfaction without any faith in God at all. This is because they have not found with their adult minds a God that's big enough to account for life, big enough to fit in with the new scientific age, 
big enough to command their highest admiration and respect and consequently their willing cooperation. The danger is we take that as a challenge for our evangelism. But people like Uncle Carl will go, God is still too small to fit in my universe. And our job is not to convince God to other people that God is real. Here, I will tell you about God and I will teach you about my understanding of God. That can be helpful, but that's not what the story is. The irony in all this is Carl Sagan then goes and writes a book called Contact, which became a movie by, with Jodie Foster as the lead star. And they receive, humanity receives this message from the cosmos. They translate it. They create this amazing thing that sends Jodie Foster on this interdimensional voyage where she has an encounter with this intelligence that is beyond her understanding, comes back, and all that people saw was Jodie's machine dropped her and she just went boom. And she has to explain that for over 12 hours she was on this journey and had this encounter with somebody and they said, no, you didn't. You just fell through the machine. You're hallucinating. Uh, there's a nice twist, spoil alert, that there is a way that they worked out. Maybe it was true. But she's in effectively a court trying to describe this journey. She says, I cannot describe it. I cannot point or show you. I have no proof, but it was real. That, and there's a nice thing Matthew McConaughey is this religious priesty dude. And she goes, now you know what faith is about. See, the Trinity is a doctrine. But more importantly, it describes an encounter with God. These first century Jewish people who knew God was one, there was only one God, experienced God in the person of Jesus, and then they experienced God in this person of the Holy Spirit, and they only had words. And Jesus used the language in the reading of Father, Son, and Spirit, and that just made enough sense for them. But that wasn't the point. They didn't go and try and convince people of the reality of God by proving that God is three in one. Their proof was to tell the story of their experience. And if you go and read Flatland, although it's called A Romance of Many Dimensions, Poor A Square actually ends up being locked up and tried for heresy for the preaching the doctrine of the third dimension, which didn't make sense. So there's a lot in there. It's about politics and religion and even stuff, you know, you could see it's a bit like 1984 and you can see it, you know, how communism and things like that worked, or even though this was way before we even had communism as a political system in the world. But in the end, we can fall into the trap that Carl Sagan does and understanding Flatland simply as a concept or as a romantic idea. But in the end, Jesus says to Nicodemus, this is about love. God so loved the world that God entered into creation as the Son that we might be saved. Our job isn't to convert people to our way of thinking. It is simply to live love and witness to that love that we have experienced, a love that we cannot fully describe, of a God who we can't fully describe, and we fail if we try to. And our job isn't trying to convince them to believe. But Jesus says that, God so loved the world that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And remember from a few sermons ago, believe is not up here. Believe is a love. The root word of believe is liber, love. It is to connect people in love with God. And that is the truth. That is the truth we live. That is the truth we tell. 
our experience that is unbelievable because I can't prove it, but I know it's real and I will show it to you, not by demonstrating its reality, but by living it to you, that you may come to know God and the love of God, which will transform our lives. So let us tell not about the God that we just know about, but it's the God that we know. Doctrine's helpful, but it's ultimately sharing the love of God with others, that they may come to know that for themselves. Amen. We're going to continue and singing about how freely God gives of that love to us. In response to all that God has given to us, we give of ourselves, our time, our energy, our work of our community, and to support that ministry, we offer our gifts of money. If you wish to support the life of our community through giving, you can do it online or in person. If you're a visitor, please do not feel compelled to do this. Our offering for God's work will be received. Freely, God, you have given us your all, yourself in three persons, your love expressed in many ways. We in turn offer ourselves to you, take all that we offer and use it for your kingdom. Amen. Um, some of the things that are happening, our services in June follow the regular pattern. Um, We've had this big donation of some bridal dresses, so Pamela and the team thought we would have a bridal show. And so they're collecting all the bits to go with that. If you would like to wear a bridal dress, um, they would love some models. Um, or if you know somebody in your family that would be a great model, that would be great. Um, that's something that's coming up. Uh, we continue to invite and um, welcome people that both donate and would like to get involved in that. There's this vision of stretching of what we're doing to have some morning teas to provide a community of love and support for the people that come and visit the op shop. Uh, many who just like to come for a chat and buying stuff is a secondary purpose. Um, Catherine Pedersen is running our Christian meditation opportunities twice a week now. 
7.30 p.m. I apologise, last week I gave you the wrong time. 7.30 p.m. on Monday evenings and Tuesday at the regular time of 9.30. Feel free to come and just experience a different way of being in prayer. Um, love to the world if you want to continue to participate that. It's also now available online via an app if you've got your phone. Um, just a way if you can have a daily notion and devotion of God. As I said today, oh, there we go, shines on tonight. Um, if you, as I said, today is National Story Day, and Nathan Tyson, who's our First Nations engagement person, he's got another word in his title that I've forgotten. Um, I'm going to get him to come and talk to us at some stage, but he can't get to everyone because he's super popular this week, um, as so many churches want to thank. So he put out a message um, just to encourage us. Yama, greetings. Uh, my name is Nathan Tyson. I am the head of First People's Strategy and Engagement with the Synod of New South Wales and the ACT. I'd just like to take this opportunity to mention that the 26th of May is National Sorry Day. Uh, on that day, we remember and reflect on the practice of the forced removal of Aboriginal children from their families. Uh, we remember the devastating impacts of those policies and practices on Aboriginal people and communities. And we remember those that are still alive today that are impacted by those things. Sorry Day is also the start of National Reconciliation Week. And in terms of reconciliation, there are a number of sort of learning resources and other resources on the Synod's First Nations resources page. So I would really encourage people to jump on to your computer and uh, Google First Nations Resources UCA. If you Google First Nations Resources UCA, you will see a link to the First Nations Resources page. There are a number of really good resources on there. Uh, this year, I would particularly encourage you to watch the Bringing Them Home video uh, that's accessible via the First Nations Resources page. Uh, it's about half an hour and it involves some real life uh, perspective of people who were um, taken from their families as well as a number of other experts and people that worked on the Bring Them Home inquiry. I'd really encourage people to have a look at that video. Um, it really is impactful. Um, it can be a little bit distressing, so perhaps have some tissues if you get a little bit emotional watching sort of difficult things. But I think every Australian should watch that video. It's just that important. So yeah, so I encourage people to um, get involved with National Reconciliation Week, get out and about, uh, look up events uh, on the internet. You should be able to find some local events. Um, get out and about, meet some people, uh, get involved in reconciliation activities uh, and help support uh, positive action moving forward. Uh, thank you very much and have a great day. Thanks. So as I said, Sorry Day isn't about guilt. It's about becoming aware and becoming more compassionate. And my journey into reconciliation as was as I started to have to teach about it, I connected with the local Aboriginal and um, Torres Strait Islander education group, and that put me into contact with First Nations people. And I was privileged that the church took me out to Wilmaringal, where we met First Nations people, and that was my first engagement. But to hear stories, of people literally taken from their families screaming. Or to hear stories of people who are told, your parents do not want you. And what that does for people. So the Bring Them Home video is a worth because believing starts with our head but actually should move our hearts. And the thing that moves us most is story. So the mess that is sometimes what's left of Aboriginal society in Australia becomes more understandable when we understand what people have gone through that have led them to be the people they are today. Um, we're going to continue in prayer. Thanks, David. Hi. Uh, yeah, we're going to join in prayer now. Um, please join with me in saying the Lord's Prayer after this prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we give thanks uh, for the blessings in our life today. 
for our freedoms and the many good things that we have in our lives. We pray for the world in which you delight, which you created for us. We pray for all those whose small or large acts of love and joy make this world a better place. We pray for those whose circumstances rob them of happiness, joy and delight, whose experience of poverty or war or disease make the world harsh, joyless and chaotic. Loving God, we pray for those in positions of power and authority in our world. May their decisions and actions be framed with compassion and care and with the interests of the vulnerable in our society in the forefront of their minds. Let them be cognizant of the welfare of communities of men, women and children and that our created world depends on. Compassionate God, we pray for those whose lives are broken by prejudice or hate or malice. Keep us alert to our own prejudices and the ways our own attitudes impact others. We especially pray for those in this country and this city who are victims of racism. We pray for the community of Christians around the world in the midst of its diversity of cultures, languages, races and nations. May it be a community whose witness to your love and truth is confident and wise in its word and bold in its deeds. Lord, this week in the ecumenical prayer cycle, we pray with the people and churches of Angola and Mozambique. We give thanks for the rich natural resources in these countries, the positive developments experienced since years of civil war, the village communities that seek to protect livelihoods and the food security of the poor. We pray for better sanitation, health services and the protection of the environment in these lands, a healing of lingering scars and memories from colonisation and civil wars, protection of land rights of the people and governments that are transparent and further the good of all people. God of community, we pray for one another. May we be wise, truthful, forgiving and loving in our dealings with each other. May what we share as a community spill over into the communities in which we live and serve. Lord, for those in our own community and circles who are suffering with illness and burdens and troubles, be with them. We pass their troubles over to you. May your healing touch bring wholeness and peace. Lord, we pray for fractured, fractured relationships. We pray for reconciliation, and especially this National Sorry Day and Reconciliation Week. And we pray for harmony among loved ones. As conflicts and wars continue in Gaza and the Ukraine and other places, our fervent prayer is for peace and for leaders to work together to bring peace. We pray for all those who are affected by these conflicts, those who have lost loved ones, who have suffered injury and illness or have been displaced and lost something or everything. Lord, lastly, today we pray for our people here, our ministry team, the staff, our elders and leaders and volunteers. We give thanks for each of them. May your hand continue to be on them all who contribute to the life of St Matthews and help us to continue to shine a light out into the world beyond our walls here as we live out our faith in you. And now please join with me in saying the prayer Jesus gave us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of fire, deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, the glory of Jesus, now and forever. Um. Our final song today is How Deep the Father's Love for Us.
God is always more, more than we can imagine, more than we can experience. God gives us more, more love than we know, more grace than we can hold, more blessing than we can share. Let us go into the world with the more that God gives us to bring more peace, more kindness, more love to all, that they may come to know God more and become God's people like us. May the blessing of the Father, Son, and Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer be with us and remain with us now and always. Amen.